Chapter 3, The Fist of the Antarctic. For the rest of December, Endurance picked her way through the ice. Blackborough peeled a page from the calendar in the wardroom every morning, counting off the days. Outside, the ocean teemed with life. Humpbacks and killer whales spouted in the distance, and the water was dotted with ice flows on which fat, blinking seals basked in the sun. Emperor penguins bowed formally to the ship and crew as they passed. Adelie penguins surveyed them from passing icebergs and called, Hark! Hark! which was the name of the expedition's biologist. The little back black Adelies, with a shocking white ring around their eyes, made a comical sight for the crew as they tobogganed off the icebergs into the water. Flocks of Antarctic petrels and snow petrels accompanied the ship on its journey toward the continent, diving with high, wild screams when the crew threw their garbage overboard into the sea. While white albatrosses escorted endurance through the ice on their magnificent, motionless wings, Leonard Hussey, the meteorologist, serenaded the passing wildlife with his banjo. McNeish remarked that the penguins were particularly attracted to the banjo music. Aye, they're queer creatures, and I'd never had been surprised to see them clapping their clappers when the doctor finished a tune. When he played with old Scots tunes, that was. They're sensible birds. They liked real music. But I can tell you that if he played anything else, they'd break away and rush off in a panic. Hussey's version of the penguins' taste was somewhat different. They liked Negro spirituals and Irish jigs. A strong favorite of which they never tired was, It's a long, long way to Tipperary. But when I turned to playing Scottish music, well, they just fled in horror, making off as fast as their short legs would carry them. The animals on board provided entertainment, too. Mrs. Chippy, who, despite her name, was actually a tomcat, discovered that he could stroll along the tops of the dog kennels just out of reach of the snapping jaws. The half-wolf sled dogs became frantic with bloodlust whenever the cat ambled by overhead. Also on board were two pigs purchased by McNeese for future pork roasts, as well as the rats and mice that stow away on any ship. Mrs. Chippy was too well-fed to bother hunting, preferring to torment the dogs and dine on scraps from the galley. The ship made progress, but slow progress. Shackleton had estimated a rate of travel that would put him on the continent by the end of December. But by Christmas, they still hadn't passed the Antarctic Circle. The holiday was celebrated with turtle soap, jugged hare, white bait, which is a type of fish, mince pies, figs, and plum pudding prepared by the cook, Charles Green. When the crew raised their glasses of stout and rum to Christmas carols and toasted, To our sweethearts and wives, the answer came back, May they never meet! As the last days of 1914 ran out, endurance continued to creep southward through the Weddell Sea. The course was never a straight one. Sometimes the ship found a lead of open water to the south and followed that with all speed. Other times, Worsley, the skipper, had to sail the ship west along the edge of the pack, searching for open water to enter, even sailing north from time to time when the pack was impenetrable or standing still, waiting for a lead. Feeling like a rat in a trap, Worsley looked for leads from the crow's nest and signaled the course to the man on the bridge. Ice blink, a white glare on the underside of the clouds, indicated pack ice ahead. A water sky, dark reflection on the clouds, showed where the open water lie. Shackleton explained, Worsley, Wilde, and I, with three officers, kept three watches while we were working through the pack, so that we had two officers on deck all the time. The carpenter had rigged a six-feet wooden semaphore on the bridge to enable the navigating officer to give the seamen or scientists at the wheel the direction and the exact amount of helm required. This device saved time as well as the effort of shouting. Occasionally, when the frigid atmosphere was changed with water, or was charged with water, rather, every rope and spar on the ship was frosted white, making endurance look like another species of sparkling white iceberg as it nosed its way through the pack. When the sun came out, icicles fell from the shrouds and shattered like glass on the decks below. Sometimes open leads of water in all directions were wreathed with wisps of frost smoke as the water began to freeze, and Shackleton commented that the effect resembled that smoke from a prairie fire. The sun never set, and even when there was fog, it was never dark. Often the crystalline air formed mirages, 
and the sailors saw icebergs suspended upside down in the horizon. These mirages made navigation around the bergs very dangerous, because it was often hard to tell what was a real iceberg and what was a phantom. Knowing the difference was critical, especially since endurance often passed more than 400 bergs in a 24-hour period. It was a crowded sea. Going back to page 19, that image there on page 19 shows endurance begins to pick its way through the ice. December 9, 1914, Shackleton wrote in his diary. I had been prepared for evil conditions in the Weddell Sea, but had hoped that in December and January the pack would be loose, even if no open water was to be found. What we were encountering was fairly dense pack of a very obstinate nature. Back to page 20. So on New Year's Eve, they crossed the Antarctic Circle at last, and some of the men gathered on the bridge to sing Old Lang Syne with an accompaniment of dog howls. The ice grew denser, and open water became harder and harder to find. There was no sign that the pack was opening up at all. Day and night, ice growled and scraped along the sides of the ship. The men heard it grinding while they slept, while they ate or played cards, while they stoked and the engines or read the charts. When fog and ice made progress impossible, Shackleton ordered the ship moored to a large iceberg, or flow. when the men and dogs could take advantage of the wide, flat flows to get some exercise. Hockey and soccer games were the sport of choice among the men. As for the dogs... They could chase penguins and run wild without going too far. On all sides was the frigid sea, where killer whales cruised in search of a meal. These beasts have a habit of locating a restful seal by looking over the edge of a flow, and then striking through the ice from below in search of a meal. They would not distinguish between a seal and a man, Shackleton noted. And you can see the two images on page 20 and 21 on page 20, that's to our sweethearts and wives, they, may they never meet. You see the gentleman there celebrating, and on page 21, a soccer game on the ice during a holdup, waiting for a lead to open so the ship could continue. Let's continue page 22. On occasion, or on one occasion, when endurance was moored to a flow, the crew hauled out the motor sledge. Ord Lees, the motor expert, got the machine going, and Marston pretended it was an ice cream wagon. Several sailors did imitations of Cockney boys begging for a treat as Marston hammed it up as an ice cream vendor. When the kidding was done, however, the men gave the motor sledge a test run. On the uneven surface of the ice, the machine turned out to be awkward and impractical, and plans to use it were abandoned. As the days went on, endurance crept forward through leads that closed in behind her. Open water was becoming harder and harder to find. A shifting mass of ice stretched from one horizon to the next. Two and a half weeks into the new year, Hurley wrote in his diary, It is now seven weeks since we first entered the pack ice, and since then it has been almost an incessant battle. The weather was not improving, and the ice showed no signs of opening. On the next day, January 19th, the first of the Antarctic closed around the ship. Endurance was surrounded by ice pack, with no open water in sight. They had sailed 12,000 miles from London. They had picked their way through 1,000 miles of ice pack. Now they were less than 100 miles from the continent itself. But endurance would never reach it. If you look at those two images, there's a huge iceberg on page 22. Page 23, the sea is frozen into an impenetrable barrier of crushed flows. January 1915. 